TV Crazy Man here. Let's go back in time and relive the good old days of classic television from the 1970s to the early 80s with awesome bloopers and goofs that'll bring back fun memories of the 70s and 80s. Ted! <laughs> you made Laugh with actors as they flood their lines and look at fascinating goofs that made it to the actual TV shows you might have missed on your old TV sets back in the day before high definition. <laughs> Here's Earl Holloman in a tense scene. The rifle is jammed. He reaches for his pistol and pulls out his wallet and his... Oh, his holster. <laughs> <laughs> and Billy and the animals were sitting on top of the hill. Woodley Lincoln? Right. Okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. I want you to act lily livid and chicken belly just like every. <laughs> Let's say you and me go down and see them steam ream the <laughs> Okay, I want you to act Lilla Levy. <laughs> you sent me a lot of... False pretenses? Yes, yes. That is? False mm -hmm. I want you to act chicken. <laughs> That's it. Remember the time that Cindy... Shirley. Shirley. <laughs> Well, Chicken. you know, live a lily. I see. You picking up on this? It's real subtle here. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? You want me to act yellow bellied and lily livered? Yeah, that's it! If we showed you everything that's 25% off during Frankie's home sale, it would take all day. We've had some sex setbacks. Hey, Here's a goof that made it to air from the TV series Kung Fu. David Carradine is fighting John Saxon when he turns into his stuntman one second, and the next we see uh, Saxon's stuntman hanging out next to the tree waiting his turn. <laughs> it was joined with Super X Drug Stores to provide you with a new service. You can now get money for Super X purchases or for any other reason. You can also make deposits and guarantee your personal checks. Imagine five and a quarter percent interest on your balance with your funds available seven days a week. And it's free. Hollywood Federal and Super X, making the things you need easier to get. Entire stocks of China. Entire stocks of... <laughs> These annual physicals. Did you give them the routine urinalysis, blood chemistry, chest x rays, K R S P? <laughs> Listen to this station, ladies and gentlemen, because coming up late, number 40 on the hip hooray! And there's even 90 days deferred billing on your prangies, pang in the wings. <laughs> well, no, not directly, but it gives someone a real good reason to have. Uh, <laughs> advantages of old age is that you're never in a hurry. Jack, closet. <laughs> you really believe you can lose weight that way? Jogging is, is it's a lot. It beats jogging. You never heard of anybody drop dying. I never heard of anybody who dropped dead from chanting. Nobody ever. <laughs> sure, it's easy for you to laugh. You making coffee? <laughs> I'll be assisting if anything goes wrong, I'll be there. But he'll be running the show. You're overlooking one irrefutable fact. Fact, Frank. Won't believe that she can be cured. The catheterization showed the possibilities that surgical frigus fork couldn't lumping starve. <laughs> the biopsy was positive. I talked with gynecology. I'm gonna win this time, <laughs> Some Indians kidnapped the assistant secretary. Some Indians kidnapped the assistant. Some Indians in. Some Indians in Washington. In Washington, isn't it? The dancer, by the 
Airways, Eric Estrada. Well, you gotta start him young, Mom. <laughs> Hey, Kev. Frank, Jesse John Hudson's on his way in. Good, Henry. Bring him to my office, will you? Right. 1942 Heisman Trophy winner from Georgia died early today at his Athens home. He was 70 degrees. That as GM stock goes, so goes the market in general. And I asked him to give us an update on the validity of that argument. Hello, Bob. Get those eyes open now. And a correction, Frank Sinkowicz, who died early today at his home in Athens, was 70 degrees. Jim? Yeah, yeah. Paul Meltzer with sports and a report on the Eagles. Big win over the bagels. Hello, Bob. Uh, uh, your title, uh... Really ...towards Christmas. Is it getting too commercialized? Are people losing the spirit? No, I think Christmas is, is a wonderful thing. I think they should have it every year. Just, just get those eyes open now. In the episode Angels in Chains, the girls are in the back of a crooked sheriff's car when they decide to try and make an escape using the very chains they are bound with, which leads to a cool car jump scene. Now heading up to the jump, every time we see the sheriff, He's moving his hands around in the air as he's choking. But in the outside shots of the car, you can see the stuntman still has his hands on the wheel, of course. And for some reason, the tag seems to change sides on the car. You know, it's a wonder people in the 70s weren't scared to death to drive a car because According to movies and TV shows back then, all it took was the slightest little bit of a dink on your car and the whole thing would just explode. I mean, every time. Well, I think there was one rule. That is that the good guy could not be in the car at the time of the explosion. Now, if you're a bad guy and you're driving a car in the 70s, you better watch out because it will not take much for that thing to explode. In the episode, Target Angels, Kelly and Jill steal a cab from this man. Later, when they pass Charlie's cab, and before it explodes, it becomes a completely different model of car. You know, you girls go through cars like Evil Knievel goes through motorcycles. Of course, that's not nearly as bad as one episode of the Dukes of Hazard where they changed the car like four times in 30 seconds. Now, just check out the damage on Charlie's cab. It looks to me like the truck is on top of the car and the hood is smashed open to where you can't even see out almost. Then they switch to the inside of the cab and you can't even see the hood. That must be Charlie. When Charlie's cab comes racing around, it's like a brand new car. This is uh, definitely like Dukes of Hazzard, you know, when it generally heals itself every time it takes a jump. Or maybe this is just a clue that Charlie has some kind of supernatural powers as we'll see later on in the video. I always love to see behind the scenes, but in the episode Consenting Adults, we see behind the scenes, in the scene. If you look at the garbage can, you can see part of a camera where one of the cameramen is hiding out as Farrah Fawcett's character, Jill, rides by on the skateboard. On the episode Angels on Wheels, Kelly's Mustang is blown up. Well, actually, they replaced the Mustang with an older first-generation model, probably so as not to blow up a brand new car, but ironically it would be worth more money today than the newer second-generation Mustang Kelly drove, even with its amazing 88 to 102 massive horsepower. Eh, uh, okay, my riding lawnmower has more horsepower than that. Before the explosion, Charlie tells Kelly on the car phone that there's a bomb attached to the car. How he knows is not revealed, unless I missed mention of it somewhere in the episode. It's almost as if Charlie has cameras everywhere. The suitcase, Angel, the suitcase! Otherwise, how in the world did he know to tell Kelly to go back for the suitcase? But why would Charlie risk Kelly's life just for that suitcase of evidence? Unless Charlie knew something that everybody else didn't. Did Charlie somehow have abilities far beyond those of mortal men? 
Kelly, did you take Morris up on the deal he offered to replace my car with an identical model? Kelly asked Charlie at the end of the episode, even though they showed us her car outside the agency. Did Charlie replace it already or was this a goof? On the episode Terror on Ward 1, a nurse is attacked in the hospital. Keep your eye on this nurse as she runs out screaming, especially her mouth. Now, I don't know if that dude she passes is more surprised that she's screaming in the first place or that she's screaming without moving her lips. In the episode Magic Fire, Kelly and Chris rush off to save Sabrina from a fire in Kelly's Mustang. I don't know about y'all, but if I had seen this when I was a kid, or noticed it, I think it would have made my brain explode. When they do arrive, it is Kelly and Chris that gets out of the car. I, I think. Uh, I, I hope. Oh, uh, please don't forget to hit the like button. It really helps the videos out a lot. This next goof comes courtesy of the A-Team's Dirk Benedict. From the episode, The Jade Trap. You can't do this to me. When Face jumps his car onto the beach to try and run over Kelly and her friend, the car sounds more like it's on pavement with all the screeching you hear. But to be completely honest, of course I've never been on a beach driving like a maniac, so possibly it might make noises that are similar to driving on pavement, for all I know. Let me know in the comments below. What tangled webs we weave, huh? We interrupt this program for a quick word from Freddy Cat Cartoons. Hey y'all, check out the latest cartoon, Freddy Cat Cartoons. Freddy and my new friend, Robinson Crusoe. He's as primitive as can be. I'll thank you, I'll thank you very much. You've been drunken, huh? I mean drinking. In the episode, Moving Violation, Ponce jumps inside a moving bus to save an older couple that we are led to believe are the only occupants of the moving vehicle. Unfortunately, the brakes go out, and then the bus starts rolling backwards down a very steep hill. Of course, Ponch, luckily, is calm, cool, and collected, as you'd expect. Brakes are out! Hold on! But there seems to be a story within the story, because long shots show us that there's somebody else in that bus. And it's definitely not that older feller that's hanging on to his wife for dear life. Of course, my theory is it's a ghost that is responsible for cutting the brake line. Or maybe it's just an extra stuntman enjoying the ride. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. In case you were wondering, Ponch did save the day. Which if he didn't, I wouldn't watch the show. Ponch? In the episode, Career Day, Ponch runs into his old high school principal, played by classic TV star Richard Deacon, who we all know is Mel from the Dick Van Dyke Show. Francis Llewellyn Poncharello. I still remember the number of probations you had. So Ponch ends up giving a speech at his old high school, which turns into a bit of a Twilight Zone time travel moment. Did Ponch somehow go back in time as the students in the crowd appear to be from the 1960s and not the late 70s? Now for some reason, Ponch does freeze up during his speech, at least at first. Which, while you may be tempted to contribute to fear of crowds, I believe that Ponch was haunted by his old high school friends, if only for a few moments. The campus lies in a direct path to another institution, commonly referred to as the Twilight Zone. So in the beginning of the episode, when Ponch writes Mr. Singleton, his old principal, a ticket, there are only three people present, Ponch, John, and Mr. Singleton. So who is the guy in the white shirt reflected in John's glasses? Another strange occurrence happens in the episode Baby Food. For some reason, the traffic in the background is turning around for no apparent reason. It's almost as if the road wasn't completed and was just being used to film a TV series. Strange, isn't it? In the episode, taking its toll, Ponch and John are watching her boss, played by Robert Pine, aka the father of the new movie Captain Kirk, Chris Pine, on television. Sergeant Joseph Gatrier. You know, those dudes are relentless. After they turn the TV off, John jumps up and grabs the TV that apparently was working without having been plugged in. I mean, they did have those tiny battery-powered black and white TVs back then, 
but not something this big. I had one myself in the early 80s. I can't remember whatever happened to that thing. My career's on the line. It's not that big a deal. In the episode, The Hustle, a dent comes up after the accident is over. Notice the back end of the car to your right. It doesn't look to have sustained any damage whatsoever. There's a big dent in it when the ladies go to look at it. On a fun trivia note, Broderick Crawford from the Highway Patrol TV series appears in this episode as himself. They don't make TV shows like that anymore. Yeah, that's right, they don't, do they? Hmm, I wonder what kind of goose I can find on the Highway Patrol TV series. Another actor from the Highway Patrol appeared on three episodes of Chips, Bill Boyette. He was a regular on Adam-12, the TV show, as well. In the episode, Hitchhiking Hitch. Ponch and John's helmets seem to be all over the place during roll call. First we see both helmets, then Ponch's, which was next to his elbow, is now missing. Then as the two go outside, their helmets are waiting for them on their motorcycles. Also on that episode, unless John has two mics, it seems there's an apparent goof here has his mic is in his hand and resting on his radio at the same time. As we start to get into the stunts, I want to be clear I'm not trying to belittle the amazing efforts of the stuntmen that risk their lives so that we could be entertained. Instead of looking at these as goofs, I guess we should look at them as tiny clues into how these amazing stunts were performed. John and Ponch are thrown off their motorcycles fleeing an exploding truck. The way they did the stunt was tie a cable around the motorcycle to cause it to abruptly stop as if they were being thrown off. If you look carefully, you can just make out the cable. In the episode Rainy Day, you can catch the type of protective headgear the stuntman wears as he almost slips a truck. It looks like a giant space helmet. The episode The Volunteers features a car pileup involving zoo animals. Back then, of course, they couldn't use CGI, and using real animals in a car stunt would be illegal, so they had to use stuffed animals in the stunt, and then include a shot after the accident with a real animal to sell the shot. One stunt they love to do on chips is have vehicles run up behind another one and then flip, and this was done with the aid of a ramp usually, which could be seen from time to time. On the episode, Repo Man, actor Mills Watson plays the bad guy. You might remember him as Deputy Perkins from BJ and the Bear and Sheriff Lobo. Mills, of course, was mostly bald, but you can tell that his stuntman had a full head of hair. In the episode Bio Rhythms, there's a stunt that really had me thinking for the longest that the stuntman on the box got hit by the shockwave of the blast by accident. I mean, the scene really seems organic, but in my research I found there is a difference of opinion on whether or not this was actually stuntmen or dummies on the bikes. So I took a long look. At first it appears that it has to be real stuntmen, but then the guy on your left appears to be clearly a dummy, the way his arms stay up in the air after he comes to a stop. What do you think? Did they use a combination of stuntmen and dummies? Either way, it's an amazing scene. This would probably look like it came from a video game if it would have been done today. I mean, I get the safety factor in using CGI, but seeing so many computer-generated images these days makes me appreciate the real-life stunt work and effort that went into these old shows back in the day. Speaking of dummies, there's no doubt that a mannequin was used on the passenger side of the van in this particular shot. Looks like they probably used a, a mannequin on the driver's side as well. This is what it looked like when they inserted the actors into the scene. Notice in the episode High Octane, as John and Ponch are in hot pursuit, John is wearing short sleeves. Up until they switch to a stuntman, then his arms are actually wrapped for the motorcycle crash that follows. Here's where using CGI to digitally add the appearance of skin back to the stuntman's arms might actually come in handy. 
I just can't stand some of these newer movies that use complete digital models of, uh, instead of a stuntman. It looks really phony when they do that. In the episode Battle of the Bands, some punks rob a van and one of them gets stuck on it as it rolls downhill. Notice there are no mattresses inside, but when it crashes we see mattresses used by the stunt driver coming out the front window. Back to the strange and the bizarre, in the episode High Octane, John rides his bike up to a truck to inspect it and then falls back. But looking closely for a second, the truck actually appears to be driving backwards. Either time just went wonky, or they ran the film backwards just for a second because they didn't want to do another shot. This next goof comes from either the coolest episode of Chips ever, or the weirdest, because it featured ninja cops who don't use guns. It was actually an attempt at creating a spin-off called Force 7. It guest starred John Rice Davies from Sliders and Indiana Jones as the bad guy, and Fred Dreyer from the series Hunter. The actual stars of Chips were barely in this episode. Works for me. The biggest goof that I found was some of those missed kicks in the show. I think it's safe to say that that wasn't even close. You know, if they would have put me, Clawed, Kung Fu Ninja Cat on that show, it would have been a huge hit. I'll thank you. I'll thank you much. Not 100% sure, but I read that this was the orangutan from any which way but loose that starred Clint Eastwood. Oh, I also noticed a goof on this one. When Ponch asked the ape to hit the brake, they didn't do a very good job of hiding the fact that the orangutan's trainer was guiding his hand. Did you know that Chris Pine was actually on chips before he was born? That's him in his mother's womb. Seen here is actress Gwen Guilford, the wife of Robert Pine, who was also playing his wife on this episode. Who can guess which actor of the Chips regular cast was on Star Trek? That's right, it was Michael Dorn who played Officer Jebediah Turner and would go on to play Worf, the Klingon on Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, humor! Ah, ah! Okay, that just struck me just then. I thought, hey, it'll work. <laughs> what is that? What? The cradle. Cradle? Ha! Births of derisive laughter. Laughter. <laughs> Something like that. I go back. Last minute. Oh, out and I failed. Watch out. <laughs> Take back. I was out in here. Yeah, about that. You and I have got to have a talk. It's not nice to sit on your face. One second, Mark's watching television. Minnie turns it off, and then it's just gone. Well, I'm okay now. Let me take it back one second. I screwed that all up. <laughs> but they didn't know. <laughs> Mindy, I got the scholarship to Notre Dame. <laughs> Just kidding. One thing I hate is sitting in a room full of losers listening to some... <laughs> Able to leap over tall buildings? Ha! <laughs> Anybody can do that in zero gravity. Robin Williams and Superman Christopher Reeve were college roommates and remained good friends their entire lives. But in the episode, Mork the Tolerant, Mork writes Superman a nasty letter. Dear Superman, Dean, how can you call yourself a man of steel if you wear blue tights with the underwear on the outside? You're a jive turkey in red booties. Love, your friend, Mork for Mork. The only problem, Superman will probably need his x-ray vision to see any writing on that letter because it seems to be invisible. That wasn't the only time that Superman showed up. I've actually got this one in my collection. Action! We've got a move! We've got a deadline! We've got people to meet! Dinner. <laughs> Here's another goof for you. In the episode PS 2001, Murph's pet frog turns into a really cheap prop with his mouth stuck open on the longer shots. I vaguely remember back in 81 pointing this out to my mom or my sister or somebody. I'm just not sure. <laughs> I hate to barge in like this, oh. but more, more, no. <laughs> oh, yes, sugar ship. Oh, yes. <laughs> I've got to stay your ocean, your ocean ship. And reset. Oh, Rosa. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the north thing. Oops. Ha, <laughs> 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 Oh. 
paid. I know where we are. <laughs> Tell me, shut up! <laughs> In the pilot episode, Starsky's positioning himself in a hallway next to a door leading to a room where thugs are situated. Once the action starts, one of the thugs try to blast through the door to hit Starsky. Something seems off here. Let's try that again. Isn't that bad guy just, uh, well, well never mind. Also in the pilot episode, Starsky and Hutch are trying to pull a hitman out of a pool at night in the pouring rain when some more bad guys walk up and start shooting. Starsky and Hutch then jump into the pool and the hitman falls in after getting shot. Then we see Starsky come up for air. Then we get a shot of this fence and then back to Starsky and Hutch. Did you catch it? It just doesn't seem like a great time for Starsky to be changing clothes right now. Of course, maybe I'm being a little nitpicky. Maybe he lost his sweater, went back down in the pool, put his sweater back on, then came back up. One more from the pilot episode. Our two heroes are on a very busy street. Notice the crowd behind Starsky. Then suddenly, poof, where did they go? You know, I think it's quite possible that Starsky and Hutch may have been an extended episode of The Twilight Zone instead of just a police drama. They're very likely turning over in their graves, or worse, getting out of them. Speaking of ghosts, this next one is really strange. Keep in mind that there's not supposed to be anybody in the back seat at this time. You're traveling through another dimension. <laughs> Also in this episode, the Torino has suffered some damage and like the General Lee from the Dukes of Hazard, seems to have healed itself later on in the episode. Because Starsky didn't have time to stop at a body shop, not when Hutch's life was on the line. Did I mention I really want this car and a 69 Dodge Charger? Wait, was that Starsky and Hutch chasing the Dukes of Hazard? Nope, it's just Cooter driving a replica on the first episode of the Dukes. In the episode, Savage Sunday, Starsky is driving a green car with a bomb in the trunk. As he jumps out and the car rolls into a vacant lot, the trunk pops off, but it's back on a split second before the bomb goes off. Granted, this one is pretty hard to see. It's still neat though. Who knows, maybe they loosened the trunk so it would fly off in the air better during the explosion and it came off too soon in the first shot. In this episode, Starsky and Hutch are riding in a taxi cab that changes interior colors shot the shot. Okay. Yeah, we uh, Step on it, will you? Then the bad guys show up. There's a shootout and Starsky ends up driving the cab through a cornfield. <laughs> right past the cameraman. Later in that same episode, there's a glitch in the space-time continuum. As the policewoman seems to get shot before she gets shot. You see that? She reacts as if she's been shot, but there's no gunshot that we hear. Think about that now, because this is the Twilight Zone. Oh, shut up. You have the right to remain silent. In the episode Kill Huggy Bear, there's two goose in one scene. When Starsky's brake line has been cut, they of course put the police light on top of the Torino, and we clearly see it as it speeds around, but then in the close-ups, it's gone. Watch what happens as they approach a parked motorcycle and a white car that's pulling out of a driveway. The motorcycle has simply vanished. Believe it or not. On the episode Terror on the Docks, the Grand Torino just disappears right before our very eyes. Unless, of course, they got one of those new X-ray vision cameras. In the episode Silence, the police light comes and goes again. 
In the episode Jojo, Starsky reveals his years of experience and training on important stakeouts by showing his ability to actually see through binocular straps. In the episode The Setup, Starsky and Hutch help a girl jumpstart her car, but unfortunately for them, it's a setup and the car is rigged with an explosive. But luckily, the Gran Torino did have a stunt double. In this episode, Starsky is just totally messing with us. First, he's got one hand on the crook and one hand holding the gun. Then he has no gun and both hands are on the crook. Then he's got the gun in his hand again and he throws it away. In the episode, Foxy Lady, Starsky is trying to get this lady to come to his house while Hutch is supposed to be taking a shower. But if you look carefully, you can see David Soul staring out the bathroom door, probably waiting for the scene to end. In the episode, Starsky's brother, keep an eye on this lady right here. Here she comes, looking very professional in her high heels. Here she comes again with no shoes on. I know it was the 70s, and I know that I never wore shoes anywhere I went when I was a kid, but I'm pretty sure that this was not professional attire in a police station. In the episode, Death in a Different Place. Starsky backs up to a house where the yard is supposed to be empty at the moment, but an unidentified man is seen trying to get out of the way of the camera. In that same episode, when Starsky and Hutch are on the road, there is clearly traffic everywhere and one car is directly behind the Torino. But when they go to make a U-turn, and all of a sudden, all the traffic has totally disappeared. Believe it or not. But what's your thoughts? Thanks for watching the TV Crazy Man channel. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the 70s super cop drama Starsky and Hutch. Let me know what you'd like to see next in the comments below. Hit the bell so you don't miss any future videos. Subscribe if you haven't already and have a great day.